recorders of Telesur English in Quito, Ecuador. I am Estefania Bravo. This is from the South. In Venezuela, the Angostura 2019 military exercises have begun. They mark 200 years since the Congress of Angostura convened by Simón Bolívar during the Wars of Independence of Colombia and Venezuela. They aim to test the operational and technical capabilities of the Bolivarian National Armed Forces. These exercises will be held until February 15th and involve more than 2 million military and militia troops. They're being supervised by President and Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces, Nicolás Maduro. Today, the most important military exercises that our history records, the most important in the context we live in, have been successfully launched throughout the national territory. A real threat, the imperialist Donald Trump's government against the peace of Venezuela. We have been threatened by the head of the empire, and that has provoked outrage, rejection by all the people of Venezuela and the public opinion worldwide, and forces us to prepare to defend the right to peace for our country, to defend the dignity of Venezuela, its sovereignty, its independence, to defend the right to live in the 21st century as a free, sovereign nation. And Venezuela's Defense Minister Vladimir Padrino López has insisted on the government's call for dialogue. A military intervention means destruction, death, the loss of lives. That is the worst threat, the military intervention. What we are asking is for Venezuela's sovereignty to be respected as it should be for any country, to solve conflicts in a peaceful way, under the people's right to self-determination. We hope dialogue is the final step, with an open agenda, so we can solve the political crisis that has been imposed on Venezuela. An army commander highlighted the historic importance of the Bicentennial military exercise. With this military exercise, we remember our history. We especially remember our liberator, Simón Bolívar, who freed us 200 years ago in Angostura. This is the best way we can honor him, our chief in common, and President Nicolás Maduro, who was elected democratically and freely. We deploy all of our military forces at the national level. Many Venezuelan people have denounced the government of Colombia for supporting interventionist attacks. But what is the opinion of people living near the border? More in this report. On the Simón Bolívar Bridge located in the state of Techira at the border with Colombia, dozens of people cross the bridge every day. Most of them denounce that they're being used as part of a psychological war operated by the United States. I say to the people of Táchira to think about it. The United States is going to come and shoot all of us. They are going to destroy our country. There is an economic blockade in Venezuela. We need to support our president. I'm a revolutionary woman. Venezuelan people say that the media campaign and humanitarian aid are part of the coup against the government, carried out by opposition members accused of committing crimes. After we cross this bridge with the first truck full of humanitarian aid, the tyranny will be over. A transitional government will begin. But a popular rejection to these opposition speeches is stronger. They want to blame the government for blocking the humanitarian aid, but it has not been approved by the International Red Cross or by any organization. Our people and our Colombian brothers are against these attacks. It's not the Colombian people who are against Venezuela, it's their government. There has been demonstrations in different parts of Colombia in support of the Bolivarian Revolution. Most of the local people at the Colombian border live in peace and they want to keep it that way, a reality hidden by the mainstream media campaign. 
It is not a secret that we have been suffering an economic war for more than four years. They have frozen the PDVSA account and international transactions. They have closed down our international bank accounts. That's our reality. We cannot deny it. That has affected our lives and our security. If they lift these sanctions, we have the resources to guarantee food and medicines that the country needs. We have the means and the resources, not only for the Venezuelan people, but also for 5 million Colombians who live in Venezuela. As well. Most of the local people at the Colombian border live in peace and they want to keep it that way. A reality hidden by the mainstream media campaign. Venezuelans all over the country have been signing a document condemning U.S. imperialism in Latin America. U.S. journalist Max Blumenthal was in Caracas to see it firsthand on Sunday. Okay, so we're here in Simon Bolivar Square in Caracas, and people are lining up for blocks and blocks to sign a declaration against American imperialism, against American intervention, calling on the U.S. not to intervene and to allow Venezuela to remain in peace. The lines are massive here, and the government is seeking to get 10 million signatures, and you can see just how long the lines are. They're stretching around the block. We're going all the way back here, all the way around this block, and they're filling up the square, and people have been coming all day and will be coming all afternoon to sign this declaration. Let's look at more on this project in Caracas. Hands off Venezuela is the message coming from those who have lined up. The signing of the people can be seen as a sort of defense against external threats and the coup which has been promoted by the opposition. I believe this gentleman has no country. He would sell his homeland and is not able to open his eyes to see that here there's a people who would give their lives in order to defend our homeland against imperialism. That's why we are signing. But the threats of the military intervention don't only come from the U.S. The self-proclaimed right-wing lawmaker Juan Guaido has not discarded any option. We will once again do whatever is possible. This is a very controversial issue, but we will use our sovereignty and our competency to do whatever is required. The calls for peace and respect for sovereignty continue. Meanwhile, the strategy of delivering humanitarian aid is being used by the U.S. and its allies to attack Venezuela in an attempt to topple President Nicolas Maduro. They have totally failed in imposing a dictatorship in Venezuela. Our people are in the streets to defend our constitution, our democracy. The coup won't succeed. The interference attempt won't succeed and we will not accept any handout from the empire under the false pretense of a humanitarian crisis. The policy promoted by Washington is not new. It's been promoting an economic war against Venezuela for years. In the last two or three years, they have stolen more than $60 billion. And now they are supposedly bringing humanitarian aid. This is just a Trojan horse or supposed humanitarian aid. What we say is hands off Venezuela and stop the economic crimes and the economic blockade against Venezuela. Many think that it is ironic that the White House promises aid worth $20 million for Venezuela, while at the same time blocking Venezuelan assets worth over $20 billion. And Russia plans to present a proposal to the UN Security Council in hopes of resolving the situation in Venezuela. Russia's proposal is in response to the U.S.'s call for new elections. It calls for a peaceful solution and a political settlement that includes the mechanism developed in Montevideo last week. <clears throat> The Southern African Development Community has expressed solidarity with Venezuela and condemned attempts by some countries to interfere in its internal affairs. In a statement, the chairperson of the SADC, President of Nambia, Hage Gengob, emphasized the need to respect the democratically elected government led by President Nicolás Maduro. He adds that supporting the self-proclamation of Juan Guaido as interim president is supporting a coup. A crowd of people gathered in protests outside of the U.S. Embassy in South Africa against the government's support for a coup in Venezuela. The protesters are from different political workers and social movements, including the ruling African National Congress and its alliance partner, the South African Communist Party. 
They are demanding an immediate end to the undermining of Venezuela's sovereignty. This follows pickets which were held on Friday at the U.S. consulates in Johannesburg and Cape Town. The African Union Summit continues in Ethiopia's capital, Addis Ababa. Our correspondent, Matuba Malachi, has the details. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres was among leaders attending the African Union 32nd Ordinary Session, and he's optimistic that conflicts around the continent will be resolved, and the UN would be willing to support governments in reducing or even eradicating unrest chaotic scenes that we've seen over the recent past. The UN chief also gave a press briefing in Addis Ababa saying Africa should not only be seen as a continent riddled with problems, but he outlined opportunities and potential that Africa has. And he's praised African governments for their solidarity in dealing with migration and opening their borders to refugees especially those displaced by conflicts. And Guterres has highlighted a misconception that more Africans are migrating to European countries. It's in fact quite the opposite. Internal migration of Africans is much higher, and Africans account for about 8% of people migrating to Europe. Now, with Egypt at the helm of the AU, President al-Sisi will hit will have to hit that ground running, rather, in a bid to change perceptions about Africa and certainly change reality of many Africans displaced by conflict. Now, Egypt has until next year to complete its mandate before South Africa takes over as chair. And the mandate will definitely include relations with other countries outside of Africa. And speaking of other countries outside of Africa, Venezuela came into the spotlight at the, at the AU summit held in Addis. President Mahmoud Abbas of Palestine telling African leaders there in Ethiopia that he rejected the regime change attempt by the United States. It's back to the studio. We'll be back very soon. Stay with us. Somos esa ventana que se abre para visibilizarlos entre fronteras. Thursday, only on Telesur. Welcome back. Hundreds of protesters turned out in the Haitian capital, Port-au-Prince, on Sunday for a fourth day of demonstrations. They are demanding the resignation of President Jovenel Moïse. The protest comes as the international community calls on Haiti's politicians to enter dialogue over the crisis. A 14-year-old boy was killed and another young man was wounded at a protest in central Port-au-Prince on Saturday. Haitians are infuriated over what they say is economic mismanagement. <laughs> Barbados authorities are expressing concern about a 15% decline in the country's birth rate. In 2007, there were just over 3,000 births, but 10 years later, only 2,000 births were recorded. Acting Chief Medical Officer says the situation is worrying. He said the problem is combined with a fall in the total fertility rate and lack of universal access to contraception. 
workers at state-owned enterprises in Barbados are being put on notice about more layoffs. This comes as the government works to manage a $718 million wage bill. Prime Minister Mia Monli says the additional layoffs will start in April. The Prime Minister says it's part of the government's economic restructuring program. About 1,000 workers have been sent home since the monthly led uh, government assumed office in May 2018. Is to kill people and to hurt. Jamaica's Prime Minister Andrew Holmes is boasting that the country has the highest number of people employed in its history. In light of this, Prime Minister Holmes is assuring that his government will continue to manage economic growth to ensure prosperity and inclusivity. He is the highest number of women employed in the history of the statistic of employment in Jamaica. More young people getting employed, more women getting employed. We're not there yet because the frustration is still there. A lot of young people still saying they've not seen the prosperity yet. One thing you can be sure of is that if we continue on this path with this government, you will see the prospect. Moving on, women took to the streets in Costa Rica on Saturday to protest against former president Oscar Arias. They are demanding that he be brought to justice after several cases of sexual misconduct came to light. And now another woman has formally accused Arias of sexual assault. The Nobel Peace Prize winner denies the accusations. <laughs> This march, this movement, is to demand that there is no impunity for Oscar Arias following the cases that have reported him for rape and harassment in recent days. Oscar Arias has to go to court immediately to account for what he did. We know that there are not five, not two, not ten cases. There are many because we know them. An indigenous community in Guatemala is doing its part to save the planet. They are turning recycled bicycles into machines that help protect the local environment and support poor families. The bikes are used for different activities from pumping water from a well to shelling a corn. From the beginning we started working the communities because they didn't have electricity or drinking water. So from the beginning we began to see how we could meet those needs. We do not pollute the environment. We do not burn diesel. We do all that with pedaling so we do not pollute the environment. Four Salvadorian migrants were detained while trying to cross the U.S.-Mexican border. They tried to swim across the Rio Grande River from Piedras Negras in Mexico to Eagle Pass in Texas, but they were chased by U.S. Border Patrol. Around 2,000 Central American migrants are waiting on the Mexican side of the border, while some are considering working in Mexico. We were ready to cross. We just needed five minutes. But then, migration officers came and we had to cross back. We had to cross the river in freezing water. It's tough. I plan to go back to my country. It's really hard to get over there, to cross. There were a lot of migration officers. Another femicide has taken place in Ecuador this last Friday. Our correspondent, Denise Herrera, has the details. Another brutal femicide occurred in Ecuador where another woman was stabbed to death by her boyfriend in Pusili, north of Quito. Then the man tried to take his life with the same knife he used to kill the victim. Under this, the Attorney General Office has confirmed a criminal investigation has started against this man. So far, an authority didn't say nothing about this situation, and it's curious that the Interior Minister of Ecuador, Maria Paula Romo, who described herself as a feminist, also didn't say nothing about this situation. So it's not clear how the government is facing this situation. Also, it's important to say in this context that violence against women and girls increases every year in Ecuador, according to the latest report made by women's organizations such as Ecumenical Commission on Human Rights that has published that 600 femicide have occurred in Ecuador between 2014 and 2018.
2018. Also during 2018, 88 cases of femicide have been registered in Ecuador and approximately 80% of these cases, the victims had already denounced gender-based violence. So in other words, the authorities or the police already knew about this allegation and it's also important to detail that in Ecuador every three days a woman is killed just for being a woman. So we will continue following this information and also we will see if the government says something about this. Thank you, Denise, for your report. The number of social leaders killed in Colombia has risen to 19 this year alone. Our correspondent, Tatiana Portela, speaks about the latest victim and explores how the crisis continues to affect the country. The killing of social and political leaders continues in Colombia. Now it's the case of Jose Arquimides Moreno, 34 years of age, who lived in northern Santander. The region has been one of the most strongly hit by violence, and several armed groups are in the area, including the ELN and the EPN, those who did not comply with the peace agreements, as well as paramilitaries and drug traffickers. Over the weekend, heavily armed men went to his home and shot him several times, resulting in his death. The police department says they are investigating those behind the attack. They've also announced a plan to protect those at high risk. Since President Ivan Duque took office, at least 217 social leaders have been killed, and in 2019 alone, the figure has reached 19. Thank you, Tatiana. After two years of protests, Brazilian unions defeated the pension reform proposed by former President Michel Temer. But now there's a new reform in sight. Let's listen to our correspondent Brian Muir with the details. After two years of street protests, strikes, community meetings and pressure on lawmakers, the Brazilian unions defeated illegitimate President Michel Temer's pension reform proposal. Now Finance Minister Paulo Guedes has a new proposal which will cut minimum benefits in half and require 40 years of contribution. In São Bernardo, an industrial suburb of São Paulo, ABC Metal Workers Union President Wagner Santana explains what these reforms would mean for Brazilian workers. The Brazilian worker makes pension contributions on average nine months per year. It would take 53 years for them to make 40 effective years of contributions, which removes the possibility of people to retire. In front of an auto plant in São Bernardo, workers express their worries about the new proposal and talk about what needs to be done to stop it. If this goes through Unfortunately, it would lead to discrimination against the elderly. If we are going to unite in the struggle against this, we have to go beyond the factories and bring this debate to society so that everyone can get involved in the important fight against these reforms. Back in the Metallurgical Workers' Union headquarters, where Lula began his career, Wagner Santana explains how Brazilian unions and social movements plan to fight these reforms. We are holding a general assembly of the working class on February 20 here in Sao Paulo. And from there, if necessary, we will call a general strike and paralyze the factories against the pension reforms. We will do it. Brian Mir, Telesur, San Bernardo. A 2,000-year-old mummy has returned to Peru from a museum in Texas. Before making its way to Lima, the mummy was housed at the Corpus Christi Museum of Science and History. According to experts, the mummy was probably a child that belonged to the Coyahua culture, the larger Aymara group that lived in the Altiplano region. We'll be back very soon. Stay with us. The life is full of moments, moments of fight, moments of hope, moments that present, moments that you can live in. Telesur Documentaries, Sundays, only on Telesur.
Welcome back, and now let's move to Africa. Speaking on Monday, the African Union's peace and security chief urged member states to tackle the root causes of extremism. At a news conference during the African Union summit in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, he decried the spread of terrorism in the Sahel region. He pointed to extremist attacks, inter-ethnic conflict, and clashes between pastoral and agricultural communities, adding to an unprecedented level of violence. So the combination of all these elements uh, brings uh, an unprecedented high level of violence and killings of innocent peoples, destroying their properties in a region that is already uh, relatively poor. Former wearing parties in South Sudan are under pressure to unify their armed forces. The peace deal dictated that both sides need to do so before a unity government can be formed. The deadline is just three months away, but there is still a long way to go. The country's president and his major adversary, the former vice president and rebel leader, signed the agreement in September last year. There is a political will to implement the, implement the agreement. So uh, Dr. Riyak will come uh, in May and other opposition leaders, they will come. So I'm still very optimistic about this peace agreement. There are challenges, if I told you, the challenge of the funding. Hundreds of thousands of Iranians have poured out onto the streets of Tehran and other cities across the country. They are marking 40 years of the Islamic Revolution. Four decades ago, the country was declared an Islamic Republic after the Western-backed government of Shah Mohammad Raza resigned. This followed the surrender of the Iranian army to the revolutionaries. On this day, almost three decades ago, anti-apartheid icon Nelson Mandela was released from prison after being incarcerated for 27 years. After leaving prison, he was driven to the Cape Town City Hall, where he addressed more than 50,000 supporters. His release followed the relaxation of apartheid laws and the unbanning of the African National Congress. Mandela's release from prison was the first step in the journey towards a new South Africa. And with that story, we've come to the end of this news brief. These and other stories, as always, find them on our website at telesurenglish.net. And for our viewers in Africa, remember you can find us on StarSat Channel 461 in South Africa and Channel 539 in Nigeria. We're on social media as well, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on Instagram. For Telesur English, I am Stefania Bravo. Thank you for watching.